Hi, my name is Paula Fiscal, and welcome to the show. For today, we have a very distinguished guest by the name of David Lisker. David is an ESL professor at the City and County of San Francisco Community College. He is also the co-director of the 2001 Freedom Riders reunion that was held in Jackson, Mississippi. And today, he's also a playwright. Welcome, David. We really appreciate your joining our show. Could you tell us a little bit about how you got started in San Francisco? Gosh, in San Francisco, well, I'm a native of the Bay Area. I was born and raised in Oakland, California. Uh, I went to school at the Oakland Public Schools, went to San Francisco State University, did my undergrad in broadcasting and uh, U.S. history, 1865 to present. And after that, I, I went to Berkeley uh, to get my master's in education, administration, and evaluation, as well as I got a degree in TESOL, which is teaching English to speakers of other languages. David, how did you end up organizing the 40th reunion of the 1961 Freedom Riders? Well, I was actually at a reunion one day at the Fox Theater in uh, Oakland, California, and uh, uh, for the veterans of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, people who went overseas uh, to fight the fascists early in World War II, and, uh, and there was a flyer there on the table saying, uh, would you like to be a part of the 1961 Freedom Riders reunion in Jackson, Mississippi? And I thought, well, gosh, that's interesting. And I noted the name of it, uh, Carol Ruth Silver, former San Francisco uh, city supervisor. And I asked someone about it, and they said, well, Carol's here in the, in the audience. Uh, maybe you should ask her about it. So I said, sure. And I, I went up to her, and I, I introduced myself. And... Uh, she and I asked her if there was anything I could do to uh, help organize it, uh, or help 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 rather with the uh, uh, with the conference, with the reunion. She said, "Well, yes, there is. You could organize it." I said, "Oh, well." So she put me on a plane to Jackson, Mississippi, and I walked there. I took some time off of school, and I walked into the the downtown area. And they said, "We're having our city council meeting today. Why don't you address them and ask for help from the?" from the local uh, merchants, uh, museums, et cetera. And I said, why, sure. So I went in there and introduced myself, and lo and behold, uh, the, the, the city opened the doors for us. Uh, they, they allowed us to visit the jails where the Freedom Riders were held, the bus station, Greyhound and Trailways where they were arrested. Uh, the Mississippi Museum of Art uh, had a special exhibit then entitled We Shall Overcome, and they hosted a dinner for us. And, uh, Medgar Evers' wife, uh, widow Merle Evers, opened up her home to us, and there was uh, just and, and many of the Freedom Riders also visited Parchman Farm, the state penitentiary, where many uh, were sent uh, after their sentencing uh, for uh, disturbing the peace, etc. Uh, so that was it was quite interesting, and people came from all over the country, and I got a chance to meet many legends of the civil rights movement, and I was we all had a wonderful time. Well, that's wonderful to hear. Now, David, I understand you've developed a particular system for teaching English as a second language students' pronunciation. Could you tell us about that? Yes. Um, I, I've developed a, a way to explain to students certain rules that which they can learn to see the difference between written and spoken, especially U.S. English. Uh, so, for example, I can give them a rule like 95% of the words in which uh, vowel T vowel pattern appears. The T is pronounced as a D, i.e., water, battery, butter, Saturday. What about at eleven would become what about at eleven, etc. And they're able to learn these and affect them. And even if they they do not speak this way themselves, and I don't ask that they do, at least it improves their listening comprehension. So that uh, the next time they say Americans speak too fast. I say, well, maybe if you understand a little bit more about how they're changing the written to the spoken, um, it won't be, it won't seem as fast to you, and they, they I, I believe, they appreciate it by and large. So. And in, in addition to this, you've also put in a, uh, a quite a bit of time. It says here, 
uh, on your musical. So could you give us a little bit about uh, how that came to pass? Well, about 20 years ago, when I first started working for City College of San Francisco, which is still open, by the way, folks, uh, contrary to, to rumors of its demise. Good point, good point. Yes, yes, we, we are open. Um, they, they had a campus, uh, Roosevelt Junior High School. Uh, we have uh, maybe 12 campuses around the city. This was one of them in the Richmond District. And at that time, due to budget cuts, uh, they closed the school, and uh, it prompted me to write a musical. And uh, the last song, coincidentally, is not or not coincidentally, is, is uh, These Are the Last Days of Roosevelt Junior High. Uh, the musical is currently being updated to reflect some of the current battles at City College as we face a much larger threat now due, the state, due to the uh, State Accreditation Committee who has closed us. And uh, so that the, uh, the theme of the, of the musical is expanding to deal with the privatization of education, uh, budget cuts in general, and attacks on unions, and uh, the growing gap between the rich and the poor. And do you have any potential backers? Uh, well, gosh, we could. We, I, I, uh, we we can always use them if there's any angels out there who might be able to come to our rescue. For fifty thousand dollars, the price of a new car for many people, you too can can produce a, a hopefully Broadway bound. Uh, Broadway, yeah, musical, a full full scale musical. It's a large cast. Probably at least twenty five uh, cast members will be needed. You know, there's students, teachers, administrators, and the bad guys, the thug boys, who of course are bent on closing down the school. Aha! Uh -huh. And so you wrote the music. Yes. You wrote the script. Yes. You wrote the score. Yes. So, any of these. Uh, parts of the musical playwright world is that something that's usually done by one person or are there is there a collaboration yeah there's usually a collaborators I, I know that the uh, the last person or i won't say the last person but one I, I guess one of the most famous people to have worn all hats was meredith wilson in in the music man and uh, so it, it's not that common but uh uh, but but yeah. you did it, and I, you spent how yeah. many years putting together the musical? Well, you know, I, I took, asking? Yeah, it took. Well, I wrote it maybe 15 years ago, but it's been on the shelf for a long time, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that I've not been able to find the time to update it and the money to really produce it. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And then, what about uh, some of the musicians that may have affected the music that you wrote for this show? Do you have any favorites? Oh, you mean as far as my own musical influences? Yes. Well, it's very much done. It's I, I'd say it's a cross between Fiddler on the Roof and West Side Story. Um, as far as uh, the musical goes, I would say it's a largely Rodgers and Hammerstein uh, influenced. So it's an old-fashioned musical, fun for the whole family. Doesn't hit anyone over the head with any politics. Uh, you could you could be on both sides of the spectrum regarding the issues, and still feel when you leave the theater like yeah. I told you I was right, <laughs> and that's fine. It'll stir debate, uh, interest, and you know, conversation. Hopefully, uh, it, it'll be well received once produced. And in San Francisco, where we have a diverse population, there should be quite a few people interested in certainly trying out for the parts in the in the musical. That's one issue for for sure. Now, I also read that you spent a little bit of time in Tokyo. Can oh, you tell gosh. us a little bit about that? Well, that was a long time ago, early in my career when I was just leaving Berkeley. Sony Language Laboratories came and they were looking for a, a teacher trainer, coordinator of their six schools, and, uh, and they, they uh, set upon me. And uh, I was happy to accept their kind offer, and I lived for four years in Tokyo doing teacher training, orientation, recruitment, and uh, materials writing for six different schools that so Sony had around the country. So I was on the train a lot from, say, Tokyo to Osaka and Nagoya and back and forth. And that was a great time of my life, as you can imagine. We're here with David Lisker, ESL professor at the San Francisco Community College. And he's also the past co-director of the 40th reunion of the Freedom Riders. And today he's a playwright. So 
please keep tuned for the next distinguished speaker. And for now, we're going to have a little bit of the music from his musical. Well, Mr. Johnson, how do you do? How do you plan to impress us at this interview? Speak, Mr. Johnson, how do you feel? Give us your all right now. Well, Mr. Johnson, I am so excited lately, I would like this job so greatly. Do you think my legs are shapely? No, no, no. Miss Beasley, that will do. So, Mr. Johnson, where do you hail from? Are you a hearty lad or are you a glum? Well, Mr. Johnson, what have you done? And what are you doing here? Well, Mr. Johnson, I come from Manhattan Island where the days are never boring. Would we ever find you snoring in the Bronx Zoo? No, no, no. whoop ti doo Miss Beasley, get a clue. It is my hope to teach a class in ESL. It is my hope to do it very well. So many years I've studied hard to be at a place like here. So many years and now I'm here. Hmm. Well, Mr. Johnson, it seems you went to school. And looking at this resume, I see you are no fool. So sit right down and listen to the necessary rules you'll need in order to succeed. Now, most important is punctuality. For without punctuality, classes simply cannot start on time. And secondly is class rationality. For without rationality, there is no reason or rhyme. And thirdly is accuracy. And accuracy must be compulsory. For without purposeful accuracy, class is so less sublime. And that is a waste of time. their presences, performances, to deal with those disturbances that rise from time to time, makes class far more sublime. Well, Mr. Johnson, what do you think of that? Are you able to make the grade or merely pass the hat? Are you aware of all there is in governing a school? Oh, Mr. Johnson, are you a fool? Oh, no, Mr. White. Oh, I am sure that I can rise, and even you I will surprise. Please do not look with narrow eyes. I'm sure you will agree that you were once like me. It's not easy to start at the top when you're down the bottom and I know you can give me the chop when you've the cards and I know you got them but please Mr. White be nice and remember when you were young and life was September and please Mr. White Please grant me, if you would, this one first chance to do good. Well, Miss Beasley, what do you think about this boy? He's bright and mature and he'll go far And if I smoked I'd offer him a cigar He's clean as a whistle and not part of a mob And since we're desperate I'd say Mr. Johnson, you got the job today!
David, when you were writing this particular uh, music, mm. what was it that inspired you for the words and the score? What inspired me? I suppose my mother had passed away in maybe 1989, and the first song that I wrote for the musical was not for the musical. It was for my mother. It was entitled, Oh Mama, Can You Hear Me? And somehow I was able to think about it later. Gee, that would fit into the storyline of In America, my musical. And that song came first then. And then another song, one day I was driving down the road and I saw an old Chinese woman in her uh, Toyota Tercel. It seemed like she'd reached the American dream. And I, st and I wrote another song called She Goes Driving Down the Road in Her Shiny Toyota Tercel. Um, and that became the second song. And then I just kind of began to study musical theater format and uh, just thought, I want to fill this out and have an entire story. And uh, the, the closing of Roosevelt Junior High School, where I was teaching at the time, part of City College, as I mentioned before, uh, gave me the, the impetus. I, I suppose it, it wrapped it all up together. The shadows are revealing, the sun is sinking low. I've got an empty feeling, I don't know where to go. The world is spinning madly, it drifts through outer space. And I feel so small, only two feet tall, can I find a hiding place? But the sun still shines, and babies cry. And neighbors lend a hand And eagles screech They almost preach They say get it while you can This land is everybody's land Yeah. 
And uh, let me ask you one more question for our viewers. How is it that you developed the interest in writing the musical while you were a professor at the uh, San Francisco Community College? Since this is a part of the evolution of my career series that sure. we're doing on the Paula Fiscal Show, I, I want the viewers to get a little idea of of how it is you, you made the transition from one career to another? Well, I guess I had always had an interest in, in music, uh, in songs, story songs, uh, mostly folk music, uh, going back to the days of Woody Guthrie, Pete Seeger, Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, etc. And um, I thought, and, and, and shortly before all of this, uh, Mayor George Moscone and Harvey Milk were assassinated, as you know at City Hall. I was a process server at the time, was in and out of City Hall all the time, you know, picking up papers, getting judges' signatures, etc. And I just come from City Hall and uh, heard that, that they'd been uh, shot and I went back up there and uh, they were as they were wheeling out the bodies, you know, we were all traumatized as was the city. And I wrote a song, my first song called The Ballad of George Moscone. And I've never played and that in where public. where is that song now? The, the, I, it's in my head. It's, uh, I played it one time for one person, and I asked if Mrs. Moscone, Gina Moscone, might be interested in hearing it. And he says, I know Gina Moscone, and she would not want to hear that song. It's, it'd be, it would upset her too much. So I said, all right, well, out of respect to the Moscone family, I've, I've never presented it at all. Well, to get back to the series, The Evolution of My Career, with our distinguished guest, David Lisker. We would also want to ask him a few more questions on how you can break into the industry of becoming a musical playwright. Gosh, uh, study the format, uh, read every script that you can, uh, go, go see as many plays as you can, see as much musical theater as you can, amateur and professional. Uh, <clears throat> look at how the storyline works and the, the through line, etc. And, and uh, uh, find interesting characters, write about something that you know, and, uh, and then try to find a backer, which is not so easy because uh, it does take uh, quite a bit of money to uh, get one of these uh, uh, productions produced. And there might be, uh, you know, you can try GoFundMe, etc. I haven't done these things if, because I'm not that technically savvy. But if anyone out there knows how to raise funds for a show, please email me at, may I give my email of address? Course, sure. Uh, my email address is Lisker Email. That's my last name, L-I-S-K-E-R-E-M-A-I-L at gmail.com. Again, that's Lisker Email at gmail.com. Thank you very much for joining us today for our conversation with David Lisker, ESL professor at San Francisco Community College and currently playwright. Stay tuned and watch our show at 3 o'clock p.m. every Sundays on Channel 29. And if you miss it then, log in to YouTube, The Paula Fiscal Show, and you can catch all the shows. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.